Hello, and welcome to My Week in Baseball. I'm your host, Phil Eschruth Harrison. You're listening to Season 2, Episode 8. All episodes are now available in both video and podcast format at myweekinbaseball.com. And as always, we have a couple of special acknowledgments. First, to Rose Petal Studios for the artwork and logos created especially for this show and website. You'll find Rose Petal Studios on Instagram at rosepetal underscore studios. Second, thanks to Brunjo Productions in Nashville for our intro music. Learn more at brunjo.com. Today, I'll talk about the latest on Louis Reyes, Shohei Otani's remarkable season, two, count them, two Bay Area teams with winning streaks, how to play between the legs catch, the invisible ball trick, and an unexpected reason the American League Central is so bad. Of course, we'll also have a timely blimmerick and a little baseball trivia teaser for you. So let's get right to it. Okay, we're going to begin with our trivia question for the day. This is a quote that is attributed to left-handed pitcher Preacher Rowe from the 1940s and 1950s. And he's talking about his pitching strategy when facing a certain well-known star of the era. So here's the quote. I throw him four wide ones, then try to pick him off first base. So the question is, what perennial all-star and Hall of Famer was he talking about? We'll have the answer a little later in the broadcast. Luis Reyes and the continued quest for 400. Now, last episode, we did talk about how he's one of the few players in recent history to even have a chance at batting 400. Well, since then, he's dropped a bit below his target of 400. But on June 19, he went five for five to get back to an even 400 batting average. Now, this is the third time this month, in the month of June 2023, the third time this month that he has had five hits in a game. Has that ever been done before? Yes, it has. And who's done it before? Luis Reyes is one of just four players to do so, and it's quite a list. If we go all the way back to 1921, George Sisler of the St. Louis Browns did it. He had five hits in a game three times in the same month. Next up, in 1922, it was Ty Cobb with the Detroit Tigers, who also managed to get five hits in three games in the same month. And the only player in recent history to do so is Dave Winfield of the New York Yankees in 1984. So Luis Reyes has achieved something very few players have, the five for five performance. And he's in a club now with three Hall of Famers, Dave Winfield, Ty Cobb, and George Sisler. So let's see how far he can take this. I'm really rooting for him to be able to hit 400 this year. It would be amazing. And we'll keep updating you on the podcast as the season progresses. Next, Shohei Otani's continuing amazing season. And it's just not an amazing season. It really is turning into an amazing career because recently Otani clubbed several home runs within a few days to pull into the major league lead. He now has 24 home runs leading the entire majors. He is also tied for the major league lead in runs batted in with 58. So if you uh, project this out over 162 game season, if he were to play all the rest of the games in the season, and granted, he probably won't. He probably has a few days off here and there. But if he were to continue at this pace, he would hit 52 home runs and drive in 125. Oh, and by the way, he's betting a cool 295. So that's the hitting side. As a pitcher, he's 6-2 and two with a 3.29 ERA, and he has a batting average against, meaning the opponent's 
hitting against him are batting just 179. People facing Otani are batting 179. And he also leads the league in another category, the fewest hits allowed per every nine innings pitched. He allows only 5.6 hits in nine innings, leading the majors. So he's an incredible pitcher and an incredible hitter. He is 32% better than the league average pitcher this year based on ERA+. Plus. And he is 70% better than the average hitter, also based on OPS+. Plus. And his OPS+, plus also leads the majors. Next, two Bay Area teams, really two, with surprising winning streaks. We'll start with the Giants, who are currently, as of this broadcast, which I'm recording uh, June 21, 2023, the Giants were on a nine-game winning streak coming into the day. And they have moved into second place in the National League West, ahead of their arch rivals, the Dodgers, who they pummeled over the previous weekend. They are trailing the surprising Arizona Diamondbacks by just three games. So the Giants do have a very good team. They're not great, but they are very good. And it's so fun to see this winning streak uh, and bringing some positivity to the Bay Area. A few statistics. They are 14th in batting average. So that's kind of middle of the pack, right out of the 30 teams. But batting average isn't all there is, all right? Offensively, they're also sixth in on-base percentage, which helps a lot. Getting guys on base helps you score runs. And they're 10th in slugging. So they're in the top half, the upper half, the top 10 in slugging, the top 10 in on base, and uh, the top half in batting average. So not bad on the offensive side. Uh, on the pitching side, they're eighth in earned run average. Again, pretty solid. That would be in the top third of the 30 teams, right? They're 15th in quality starts. Uh, if you'll remember, a quality start means that you uh, throw at least six innings and you allow three or fewer earned runs. So kind of middle of the pack in that, but still good. And they're ninth in whip, walks and hits per inning pitch. It basically mean how many runners are getting on base. They're ninth in that category. So this is the top third in whip, top third in ERA, and uh, right at the top half in quality starts. So they're a pretty balanced team, and I think that is helping them a lot. So I hope they can have another good season here. Um, they're certainly got a great streak going, and let's see it continue. The second streak, also in the Bay Area, are the surprising Oakland Athletics. Now, the A's have been by far, by far, the worst team in baseball until recently. They were on a pace to set the all-time record for the worst team ever, and they still might do so. More on that in just a moment. But recently, they won seven games in a row. This is a horrible team, one of the worst teams ever, and they won seven in a row. And you will ask, or I will ask, has that ever happened before? I always think with baseball, uh, surprisingly, it often has. So, but not in recent history, not even in what's considered the modern era. The only two times that a team this bad has won seven in a row, you have to go back to the 1800s, to the Louisville Colonels, in 1895, and if you go back another 10 years to 1885, the Detroit Wolverines. So you had to go pretty far back to find uh, a team that had been this bad that can go on this kind of a winning streak. And it's very exciting. Um, I actually listened to a podcast the other day put on by the Athletic Baseball Network, and they were talking to the A's broadcaster, and he was talking about how exciting it is to see the young players develop and improve and that suddenly some things are starting to click. They're playing a lot better as a team. And that's fun to see, especially with all the the difficult news uh, with the A's and the likely move to Las Vegas. So let's go on just a little more about this. But at the... Uh, it, it, so... If the A's can win just a few more games, they will no longer be the worst team in baseball this season. 
that honor could soon belong to the Kansas City Royals, who are hovering right around the same mark. They are within a couple of games of the Royals. So really, just by playing slightly better, they won't even be the last, the worst team this year, let alone the worst team in history. However, that said, at their current winning percentage, if they were to play the rest of the 162-game schedule at their current winning percentage, uh, it would be a really close call whether or not they would be the worst team uh, in the 162-game season era. That's I'm not going all the way back to the like 1899 Spiders that have the all-time, all-time worst record. But let's just talk about the 162-game season. So the the 1962 Mets are the worst team, you know, in recent history uh, by a long shot. They lost 120 games in 1962. Uh, but the 2003 Detroit Tigers were very close. They lost 119. What their current rate, if they if they continue the rest of the season at this winning percentage, and hopefully they'll do a bit better. Uh, if we've seen it by this recent winning streak they had, um, better things are to come, you would think. But if they continue on this pace, they will lose a projected 121 games. So that they would be one game worse than the 62 Mets. So we're going to keep rooting for the A's. Uh, let's hope they do a bit better and don't set that all-time record. Um, some comments um, about their move to Las Vegas. Now, it's not quite a done deal. Um, the owners still have to approve it. And uh, so recently, I believe it was the governor of Nevada signed uh, the bill that will allow for the uh, state funding for their portion of a new stadium in Las Vegas. Um, but the last hurdle would be that 75% of the uh, MLB owners need to agree to the move. And I'm, I'm not sure if that will happen. I haven't heard much, uh, really anything about what the other owners think about this. Uh, my gut feeling is it will probably go through. Uh, it was really disappointing, though, recently, uh, Rob Manfred, the commissioner of baseball, made some really unfortunate comments um, about uh, the A's. The, they recently had uh, a fan base that uh, came together for a night and said, let's have a reverse boycott instead of not coming to the game, um, which doesn't really show your support. It just shows your, your anger at the team leaving. Uh, we'll have a reverse boycott and we'll get as many people to come out as we can. And they had a good turnout. It was something like 27,000. Um, and if that was in the new stadium they're talking about building in Las Vegas, that would be close to a sellout. It's a, the new stadium supposed to be on the small side, uh, seating 30,000. Uh, now in the Oakland Coliseum, okay, it's not quite full, even at 27. But Manfred said something that was just disappointing. He just said um, he was asked about what he thought about the reverse boycott and all the fans who did show up. And he said something in, in uh, now. I didn't hear it. I read it, but it felt like a sarcastic tone. Uh, he said something to the effect of, yeah, uh, yeah, what did you think of that? Oh, well, yeah, gee, it was great to have um, one game the whole season, an average crowd for a major league game. That's kind of disappointing, you know. He, he could have been more friendly about it. He could have said, it's great to see the, the A's fans supporting their team. You know, I know it's a trying time for them with the uh, potential move to Las Vegas. You just could have been more considerate. It's just, it's unfortunate to hear uh, that kind of thing. Uh, moving on. So congrats to the Giants on their nine-game winning streak. Congrats to the A's on their recent seven-game winning streak. And next up, the Between the Legs play. So you may have seen a video clip of this, and if you haven't, you will want to look it up. It's pretty amazing. Louis Galorme of the AAA Syracuse team, uh, which is the AAA affiliate of the New York Mets, recently made an unbelievable play. The batter 
hit a little dribbler to the right-hand side of the infield, and it looked like a sure infield hit. Well, somehow, Guillerme, who's playing second base, charges the ball. He picks it up barehanded just as the ball reaches the dirt right behind the infield grass. And he tosses the ball underhanded between his legs. It bounces once, and the first baseman makes a nice, clean pickup to complete the out. And it's really a, a spectacular play. I love stuff like this. I've never seen anybody throw a ball between their legs, especially getting the out. So congrats to Louis Guilherme and uh, to the Syracuse Mets. And we'll hope there's more good things in store for him in the future. Now, you may have heard about the hidden ball trick, but have you ever heard about an invisible ball? In a Yankees A-League game earlier this season in Hudson Valley, New York, the catcher, Antonio Gomez, might have nabbed the runner at the plate. If only, if only he could find the ball thrown home by the right fielder. It bounced on the throw and came to a stop just a few feet away from the catcher Gomez. But he absolutely could not find the ball as runners continued circling the bases. Why? It was hidden in plain sight. The white baseball died on the first base foul line, which of course is made of white chalk. So the white on white did not stand out and it allowed a second run to score while the batter made it all the way to third base. Eventually, the first baseman came down the line because the first baseman saw it. He had to come down the line and pick it up. So you feel bad for Gomez because that, that's kind of embarrassing. But when you see uh, the replay on video, you can imagine he's looking for the ball to be standing out. He's like, you know, that quick turning of the head, and he can't see it anywhere. So white on white, the invisible baseball trick. Next up, our baseball limerick, our blimerick that we have on every episode. And this time it's a tribute to the invisible ball. So here we go. A leather ball painted white was thrown to the catcher with such delight. It dropped on the white line, matching the ball's color so fine that the ball was invisible, out of sight. Next, the effect of a balanced schedule. Now, the central divisions in both of the leagues are not too hot, but especially the American League Central, where currently the Minnesota Twins lead the division, and they are below 500. Now, this could partly be attributed to the new balanced schedule where all teams play each other during the season. It means less games against your own division. So in this case, less games against weak opponents. So say the Twins uh, in the past would have played more games against their American League Central opponents who were also not very good easier to win against them. And now they're playing more games, say, against all the different National League teams, for example, the National League East, which is very strong. And that could make a difference in your overall record. So the way this works is this season, you play 13 times a piece against teams in your own division. And that's down from 19 in previous seasons. So that's 19 minus 13. That's six games less per team. There are four other teams in your division. Now it's that six times four. You have 24 total games against other teams. And those could be better teams than you used to play. So that's one explanation, at least, for the poor record of the teams in the AL Central. Um, even that, in fact, I'm going to uh, look at that right now because even the Detroit Tigers, uh, my Tigers, who are, I know I'm wearing an ace cap today in honor of the seven game winning streak. 
But even the Detroit Tigers, who are not too good, they're 32 and 41, nine games under 500 right now, and they are in third place. They're only three and a half games out of first because the Twins are 36 and 38. They're two games under 500. So instead of the, you know, the Twins getting to beat up on the Guardians and the Tigers and the White Sox and the Royals, the Royals are quite poor this year. Uh, yeah, they're having to play a more balanced schedule against teams that are likely better than they had to face in the past. So let's just look at the NL East. You've got the Braves, the Marlins, the Phillies, all over 500. Um, and you've got the the Reds, you've got uh, in the Central, and you've got the Diamondbacks, the Giants, the Dodgers, all quite good in the NL West. So any increase in the games you play against those teams and decrease against the weaker teams in your own division helps uh, lead to that less than impressive record. So I don't know. I, I'm certainly rooting for the Tigers. You, you hate to see a team make the playoffs, though, that's below 500, regardless of who it is. Um, so I hope whoever ends up winning the AL Central can uh, at least play a few games above 500. So it's not an embarrassment having them go into the playoffs. And finally, the answer to today's trivia question. So we'll just remind you what it was. I throw him four wide ones and then try to pick him off first base. The question is that a quote is attributed to Preacher Rowe, the pitcher. He said this about pitching to whom? Now it's a Hall of Famer, perennial all-star from that kind of era. So think 1940s, 1950s era. Well, if you said Stan Musial, you are correct. So how do you get Stan Musial out? I throw him four wide ones and then try to pick him off first. I like that. Now, it might not work so well in 2023 with the new rules, though, because you only have two pickoff attempts. And if you don't get him on the third one, he automatically advances to second base. But it's a great idea, a good pitching strategy against one of the greatest hitters of all time. So that's all for today, my friends. Join us next time, because honestly, what can be better than talking baseball? As always, I'm your host, Phil Eshtruth Harrison. We'll see you next time on My Week in Baseball.